Ecest Virgo prudens, que venient es ponso, aptavis lampades huas, et introivit cum domino ad numsias. I'm Andrew Dunning, a manuscripts curator at the Bodleian Library, and today we're going to explore Alice's journey through medieval Oxford. What is it about the delightful nonsense of Alice's adventures in Wonderland that gives it a sense of timelessness? Part of its genius is the story's ability to draw on more than contemporary culture. The story was conceived on a boat journey between two of the major landmarks of medieval Oxford, from the edge of Christchurch to Godstow. Lewis Carroll, the pen name of Charles Dodgson, was a fellow of Christchurch. The original Alice was Alice Little, the daughter of the Dean. Henry Little is now best known to students for Little and Scott, his Greek-English lexicon that has never gone out of print. Alice in Wonderland opens with a prefatory poem that describes how the story came into existence. On a summer afternoon, the 4th of July, 1862, Dodgson and his friend Robinson Duckworth, fellow of Trinity College, went on a boating trip along the River Thames. They took three of the little sisters, Lorena, Alice, and Edith. In the poem, Dodgson gives them generic Latin names to protect their identities, Prima, Secunda, and Tertia. They began at Folly Bridge on the border of Christchurch, where Dodgson lectured in mathematics. Christchurch was originally a medieval monastery, founded, according to legend, by Frideswide, Oxford's patron saint. In the 12th century, the monastery became St. Frideswide's priory. Its canons created a shrine to Frideswide that became a pilgrimage site for everyday people with health problems that medieval physicians could not heal. When all else failed, pilgrims looked to faith for healing as a last resort. Although church reformers had destroyed the shrine, the 19th century had revived interest in the story. When the boaters set out, Edward Byrne Jones had only just, in 1859, finished an elaborate stained glass window based on the medieval story of Brideswide. Among the objects that he depicts is a well. And this brings us further up the river. Alice's journey begins when she falls down a very deep well in conversation with the sleepy Dormouse, we'd likely agree with her disbelief at his treacle well. Once upon a time there were three little sisters, the Dormouse began in a great hurry, and their names were Elsie, Lacey, and Tilly, and they lived at the bottom of a well. Why did they live at the bottom of a well? The Dormouse again took a minute or two to think about it, and then said, It was a treacle well. Although Alice is the first to know use of the phrase treacle well, the feature was almost certainly inspired by a real well that Christchurch had inherited from the medieval priory. Brideswide was a princess who had become a nun and spent years in hiding from King Algar, who was aiming to abduct her. In the 12th century narration by Robert of Cricklaid, the prior of St. Frideswoods, she fled to Bampton, but soon drew unwanted attention from locals after the news spread of her healing powers. She then fled to Thornbury, an isolated location just outside Binsey. Water was a problem for her band of sisters. After they miraculously found a source, this became a site for pilgrimage. Because the riverbed was far away, and it seemed inappropriate to her that the sisters should go there to drink water, she obtained a well by prayer. It is there to this day, providing the free gift of health to many who drink from it. Dodgson was playing on the archaic origin of treacle, which referred not to a syrup, but to medicine. The well was the subject of much interest for another member of Christchurch, Thomas Prout. 
The inscription now on the wellhead states that he had it rebuilt in 1874. He had a reputation for falling asleep in meetings. Be careful how you treat your colleagues. You might end up as a dormouse. The earliest story of the pilgrimage to the well is from the early 1180s, a Bodleian manuscript. Philip of Oxford wrote The Miracles of St. Frideswide with a delightfully graphic account of a women's pilgrimage to the well. A woman named Bricktiva from the vicinity of Northampton had lost hearing in her right ear for a full year and ten weeks. When she had come to the Church of the Holy Virgin to recover her health, those standing round her urged her to go to the well that the Blessed Virgin had obtained from the Lord during her lifetime by her prayers, which is about a mile from the city. She immediately walked to there, and filled her ears with water from the well. A ringing in her ears and a tribulation of itching immediately followed. She inserted a stalk into her ear and drew out a small portion of flesh. She had received the gift of hearing perfectly. The well is in the churchyard of St. Margaret of Antioch, who can still be seen in a 14th century window that the medieval canons added at Christ Church. The building that stands is from the 12th century and still makes for an accessible break from the concerns of modern life without even electricity to create a distraction. Alice and her companions ended their journey at Godstow, best known for its ruins of a medieval convent, which may hold the key to the story's unsettling conclusion. The Abbey of St. Mary the Virgin and St. John the Baptist was a community of Benedictine nuns founded in 1133, not long after St. Bridesweed's Priory. Today, as in Dodgen's time, it is mostly used for picnics and inhabited by cattle. Only a handful of walls give a sense of the building's scale. For anyone with even a dim awareness of the past, it is impossible to go there without thinking of the destruction that King Henry VIII inflicted on Britain, which included the dissolution of Godstow in 1539. Today, Henry is best known for his penchant for chopping off his wives' heads at random, and cannot help but draw a comparison between him and the similar behaviour of the nightmarish Queen of Hearts. In the illustrated manuscript of the early version of the story that Dodgson presented to Alice Little, his drawing of the double-chinned queen looks remarkably like the stereotypical depiction of Henry VIII. Readers have made many hypotheses about the origins and meaning of the strange creations of Alice in Wonderland. Some of these are far-fetched, but there's no question that the medieval world was on Dodgson's mind. He designed a presentation manuscript for Alice in the style of a late medieval book with decorated borders and Victorian interpretations of Gothic lettering. Through the looking glass, he even includes a reference to Anglo-Saxon attitudes, using an art historical term for a style of drawing visible in works such as the Bodleian's Junius manuscript. An awareness of different societies contributed to Dodgson's diverse mental furniture and turned this story into a well-loved book, which itself has changed how we understand Oxford.